Okay, well, welcome to the Poetry Box Live. Our next featured poet is going to be Mark Thalman, author of Stronger Than the Current. Mark Thalman is also the author of Peasant Dance and Catching the Limit. His work has been widely published for four and a half decades. His poems have appeared in the Patterson Review, the MacGuffin, Pedestal Magazine, and the Valparaiso Review. Mark received his MFA in creative writing from the University of Oregon, then taught English and creative writing in the public schools for 35 years. Now retired, he is the editor of poetry.us.com and lives in Forest Grove, Oregon. Please welcome Mark Thalman. Thank you. Also, I um, want to thank Sean for hosting this. And also, of course, uh, thank her for the great job she did on my book. This is Stronger Than the Current, and I got to paint the front cover, which I was delighted to do. Stronger Than the Current is in two parts. And the first section is called Some History. It's about the first um, half of the last century in logging in, in Oregon. And the first section opens with a quote from Ken Kesey, sometimes a great notion. They say the first spar is the tallest, but that's all hokum. Everyone you climb is the tallest. The opening poem is Logging the Umpqua. I sink spurs into bark, pull the rope secure. The wind makes sounds, trying to speak one word. Down the mountain, two field hawks, patient as gods, glide across the meadow to the far ridge. I use my axe, then saw until the top leans, bending the tree like a stem of ripe wheat. When you hear the wood begin to crack, splinter, hold tight, that fur comes springing back. I ride the whipping sway. Below, branches snap, the crown explodes, hundreds of years old, the moan. Many years ago, on my daily walks with my golden retriever, Sherlock, we would walk under some firs. And in these fir trees was a big branch that was dead. I always kept my eye on that to make sure it didn't fall down and hit us. And those are called widow makers. This next poem is widow makers. High in a fir, a dead limb, on the next breath of wind, call it chance, this branch breaks. If one of the logging crew gets club, it's only 50-50 before they get up, if they get up. A hard hat can't ward off heavy artillery. If the top of a tree leans like a drunk, I'm not too proud to circle around. The hammer is caught. Fate pulls the trigger. Part two of the book is called The Daily Forecast. And every year, my parents would drive from Eugene to Pendleton uh, to see my grandparents on my father's side. Back in those days, it was an all day trip because the interstate highways had not been built yet, they just didn't exist. And one of the places we would normally stop for dinner was Arlington on the Columbia River. This is called Arlington, Oregon, 1956. The railroad and highway snaked along the river. Up the slope, huge oaks shaded yards on blistering summer afternoons. In the evening, sun near town would fall into shadow while the far side of Columbia still baked. Mom said, this is the last time we will ever 
see this place. When the dam is finished, everything will be underwater like the castle in your fishbowl. I had visions of salmon swimming down streets and slipping through empty windows. Tugging her sleeve, will they move the trees? No, she said, and fell silent. After I wrote my first book, Catching the Limit, I realized I didn't have any poems about Eastern Oregon. So I decided to remedy that problem. And so this next poem is called Eastern Oregon. Out here, miles from anywhere, coyotes, cattle, and sun become your companions. Hills roll and fold, a sea of giant swells, then flatten out, lie calm in bleaching summer heat. When evening unveils its stars, life shrinks under the universe. For centuries, Nez Pierce came to trade for Columbia salmon. Then pioneers snake wagons down the Blue Mountains. Even today, dust devils coil up and rivers cut deep gorges. Sage grows low so wind can go where it wants, whistling through wire fences. I have a history degree, so I try to get a lot of history into my poems. And I also uh, really like the last line of that poem because it rhymes four times and still makes sense, which for me is like hitting a home run. This being March, I thought it would be appropriate if I read you a poem named March Weather. Uh, the poem was rejected 29 times. So the 30th time was the charm. And that was over the course of 16 years. And of course, some years I just didn't even send it out. Uh, but last Saturday, it was republished in an online anthology called Your Daily Poem. And then a woman from Jacksonville, Florida contacted me and wanted to make 40 copies. And I said, sure, great. And she wanted to give it to her clients for Meals on Wheels. So the bottom line is, if your poem has good ideas, keep revising, believe in the poem, uh, be persistent, it really pays off. Not all poems take that long, but some do. March weather, rapidly approaching across forested hills, comes a crashing roar I have never heard before. I call my golden retriever and we run, trying to make it home before the blast. Reaching the front porch, pale, 12 gauge shot, pelts the ground, ricochets off while the roof thunders thousands of hammers. I fix a cup of tea. Sherlock laps his water urgently. We listen to the storm begin to slacken. The ticking of ice, like someone throwing rice, a wedding of winter and spring. Technology isn't always what it's cracked up to be just like trying to get on to uh, read today. My computer wouldn't work right, so I'm on my cell phone. And if you go fishing, you need to watch where the osprey catch the fish. So that's where you can go to catch fish. And if you wanna know what the weather is, watch for a herd of wild goats. The daily forecast. Early mornings, after the fog has risen, I watch for wild goats from my kitchen window. If they meander along the high ridges, the day will be clear and sunny. When the herd comes down to graze in the meadow, count on rain. Spotting them somewhere in between, I make my best guess depending upon which way they happen to be going. However, if they hide in the woods, 
a big storm, a heavy fist is about to hit. To predict the weather, I don't need a barometer, radar, or satellite dish. The goats are seldom wrong. The title of Stronger Than the Current comes from this next poem. And I think everyone needs to stay strong considering what we've just been through in the past year. And this poem has a rowboat in it and everyone needs a metaphorical rowboat to get themselves by, like the character in this poem. This is called Mapleton. Every year, the mayor runs a contest to see who can guess the annual rainfall. After a few good storms, the Syusla rises, drowning Helen McCready's prized tulips. The rowboat tied to her front porch is again useful. She has no intention of moving. Helen was born in this house, and so was her mother. Her patience is stronger than the current. From the back porch, she fishes for salmon. And Mapleton is east of Eugene towards Florence, if you ever want to visit there. And don't blink, because otherwise you'll miss it. It's a really small town. To the west of Forest Grove is where my wife and I live, or we live in Forest Grove, but to the west of us is the Tillamook Forest. And the average rainfall is 10 feet a year. And it's even more if you measure the rain on top of the mountains. So this is called rain country. And it rains a lot in Oregon. To say it rains in the Tillamook Forest is like saying the sun shines in the Sahara. Sometimes locals go crazy from the constant drip only summer can shut off. Winter days wash your psyche until it's wrinkled as skin that's been in the bath too long. Some say living here is torture. Others say they wouldn't have it any other way. In contrast to all that rain, the Tillamook Forest had a series of fires that destroyed over a half a million acres of old growth timber. And of course, we've had a lot of bad forest fires on the West Coast this year. Uh, there were four forest fires in the series spanning from 1933 to 1951. So this is the Tillamook burn, 1933. Jagged as a king's crown with a diameter of nearly six feet, the rings of this stump are impossible to count. A decayed tooth, the middle is hollowed out. Weathered gray as granite, the thick shell has become its own monument. A dark blaze stretching down one side testifies to where flames seared through bark. Relic of a fire so hot, ash like snow piled a foot deep fell on ships hundreds of miles out to sea. Violent winds created by heat, powerful as a hydrogen bomb, uprooted giant firs, vaporized streams, all caused by a logging cable, scraping over bark, igniting a spark in a timber. And my last poem is going to be about Forest Grove. This is called David Hill Road, and it's one of my favorite destinations to um, take our Shetland Sheepdog for a walk. David Hill Road. Whoever owned this 54 Chevy sedan must not have been a mechanic or a conjurer who could raise machinery from the dead. Instead, too cheap to have it towed, the car rests in a traffic of weeds. Seed tufts poke through the grill like steam issuing from an overheated radiator. 
Plum trees blossoming form clouds of exhaust, while a blackberry vine, a policeman, taps at the driver's window. On clear summer nights, under the bright headlight of the moon, crickets hum a well-tuned engine. The Chevrolet appears to be speeding through the soft blue landscape into tomorrow, rushing into the future of its own slow decay. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. And I have to say, since I'm not from Oregon, I've, I've lived here for about seven years now, I learned so much from this little book. <laughs> I mean, so much history. And, and to present it as poetry, double bonus. So bravo. And uh, I cannot believe that poem, March Weather is the one that took 30 years to get published. You said? I'm like, no, 16. 16 years, I'm sorry. <laughs> 30, yeah, that was a little long. Um, because I love that poem. That was one of my favorite ones yeah. when I read the, the read through the uh, chat book the first time. So that's shocking to me that it took that long. Um, but way to well, be consistent. I, I think my poems always get better after they've been published. <laughs> good, good point. 